Well, good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. Oh, it's good to be with you. Thank you, band, for leading us in music. Solid tunes this morning, you guys. Then again, solid tunes every Sunday. Amen? So, Easter memories. I bet if we went around the room, we could probably share some awesome Easter memories. I, I've got a few. One is a very scary Easter bunny costume that my uncle decided to dress up in in the, in the 70s. And in the 70s, they didn't do really anything well, especially Easter bunny costumes. So uh, I remember one Easter getting a bunch of hollow Easter eggs. As a young boy, I'm thinking there's got to be candy or money. Open it, nothing inside. I'm thinking, is this really what Easter's about? My favorite Easter memory, though, was when, uh, so my family started going to church when I was in junior high. Now, I didn't grow up in a Christian household. My family consisted of atheists and agnostics, and that's a whole different conversation for a whole other time. But as a freshman in high school, and there was a wealthy family in Paradise Valley who lived in one of those houses way on top of Mummy Mountain, and uh, they were doing Easter sunrise service, and they recruited the high schoolers to take the piano to the top of the roof. So I was recruited as one of those kids, and, you know, I was, th- I was just all full of, you know, strength and energy. I'm like, yeah, and we're carrying this piano up this spiral staircase on the side of this house up on top of Mummy Mountain, right? Service was awesome, right? But on the, on the way down, there's this driveway, and literally the incline was like this. They shuttled you up in these really high-powered vans. And I, I thought it would be a great idea to run down the driveway from this house. Now, at, as a freshman in high school, you'd think I'd learned something about gravity in, in science, uh, that there comes a point when you run down an incline, and there's a point in your mind where you lose control of your legs, and you're like, brakes aren't working at this point, right? Uh, and at the time, I told people that I began to do a Pete Rose down the driveway. Today, it would be probably be a Paul, Paul Goldschmidt, right? Go diamond by, by back. So I lay one out flat down this driveway. And my Easter that year consisted of strawberry jelly scabs all over the front side of my body. Good Easter. Happy. He is risen. Well, not, not right away I wasn't risen at that point. So, But my face and my chest and my hands and my knees rode rash like you wouldn't believe. All because I thought I was in control, but I really wasn't. And things got out from under me in more ways than one, and I just laid it out flat. And I'm thinking to myself, what an apt metaphor for perhaps many, if not all, of our lives this morning. We feel like we're running down this hill, and some of us are at that point where we are no longer in control of our legs, and we are just wondering when we're going to do a Pete Rose in life. We're wondering when we're just going to lay it out because it just seems like we can't stop. And we're ready just to get road rash in our lives like, like you wouldn't believe. And this morning, my, my hope and my prayer is that we would today hear God's voice speak to us and tell us there's a way to slow down. There's a way not to lose control of your footing. There's a way to avoid laying it out and getting a road rash all over your figurative body and life, that there's a way, and the way is really the way of rest. We live in an environment where we have yet to learn to slow down. You think about the external things at work that are reminded us of the fast-paced world we live in. Think about the population clock. You ever seen the population clock? How quickly the population of our world is increasing. My son just asked me yesterday, how many people live in the world? I'm like seven billion plus people. But if you want to go online and see, there's a real life ticker that is consisting of these these numbers. This must be Apple products. Look, the numbers aren't even moving. Can we get the can we get the computers to work back there? I'm not an Apple guy, but you know, if Apple knew what they're doing, these numbers would be flying, but they're not. So, but that number of the world population is increasing like this. Now, if that's not enough for you and fast enough for you, let, let's look at the national debt counter. Have you ever guys seen? Now, check this out. Now, I'm not only going to give you the national debt, but there's some, and again, if Apple knew what they were doing, these numbers would just be flying off. Top left corner, U.S. national debt. That number is going so fast. I mean, during the summer, you could use it for a fan in Arizona. That's, that's how quickly that, that number's spinning. And yet, these external forces are reminding us that the world is not slowing down. 
and it's not slowing down and it doesn't care anything about you. Technology is increasing. I mean, just when you think you got the latest and greatest, Samsung releases this phone. I, uh, Apple releases this phone. Oh, you don't have this app yet to make your life better? And we have all this stuff that we think is going to improve the pace of our lives. And it really ultimately just turns into keeping up with the Joneses, doesn't it? The fact that it's all making us restless. Our lives in general are trying to keep up, and you'd think if we're moving towards more uniformity, we're not. We're, we're faced with more choices than ever. At a faster rate, we cannot keep up with the choices that we're compelled to make. How many, let's just be honest. This is, we call this just the true life zone, right? We're, we're living true life together. How many of you have turned on Netflix and literally scrolled through the options for about 45 minutes to an hour and still haven't decided on something to watch? I mean, let's think... We have so much at our fingertips, and we're just like, what do you want to watch? Honey, what do you want to watch? No, I don't want to watch it. And then all of a sudden, an hour's gone by, and it's like, well, let's just go to bed. (laughs) So now, instead of watching anything, it's just watching the menu, right, of all the options. And not only that, I continue to add things to my queue in Netflix that I know I'll never watch, right? I I just put a new release in there. It's called Saturday Night Fever. I still haven't got around to watching it, you know, so... People tell me all the time, Scott, have you seen this? No, and I'll add it to my queue. My queue is literally 10,000 movies right now. Are you feeling restless? Are you feeling restless like many of us are? And, And let me just tell you, it's not just the external stuff. Think about your own heart. I don't know your heart this morning. You don't know my heart this morning. But is your heart restless today? Because if we're honest, someone once said, most people in our world are being crucified between two thieves, the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow. Are you dying on that cross of, of busyness, of restlessness, because of the shame and guilt that haunts you from the past, or perhaps the uncontrollable, unforeseen future that lies ahead of you? We're crucified on that cross because of the restlessness in our hearts, and, and literally we can't enjoy right now. Well, this, this is a moment for us to slow down and perhaps hear what God may want us to hear. He's got something to say. And oftentimes God doesn't shout. He whispers. And so today's the day to slow down. And go, okay, God, speak to my restlessness. We've been going through the book of Genesis here on Sunday mornings. And it's a book of origins, right? If we, if we understand history, if we understand where we've come from, if we understand the God behind this creation, if we understand us as created creatures in his image, things begin to make sense. And last week we looked at the first three verses of Genesis chapter 2. No need to turn there. You're, we're actually going to be in Hebrews chapter 4. This morning, so turn your Bibles there if you would, or on your smartphone. Uh, Apple users might take longer to download a a Bible. A Bible this morning. I'm just saying. Um, I don't know what's going on with Apple today, but uh, download the Bible on your smartphone, your tablet. Hebrews four is where we're going to be. But notice the words of of Genesis chapter two. Just just for refresher, we looked at this last week. God had seen all that He created, and He said, "It is. It's good. It's very good." And so God in Genesis. Chapter 2, it says in verses 1, 2, and 3 that God rested from his work. He rested from his works. And now Genesis chapter 2, those first few verses, sets the stage for now God resting from what he has created, taking satisfaction in what he's designed, and saying, now I get to interact with what I've created. And the greatest creature he had created to interact with is us. You have been designed, you have been created to have relationship with him. And that's what Genesis 2 sets us up for. Our relationship with God, God says, is the most important relationship. There's no joy to be found outside of that. There's no satisfaction to be found outside of that. This is what God has set up. But then we come to Genesis 3, and man forfeits his rest. Genesis chapter 3 Man rebels against God, chooses to take matters into his own own hands. I mean, that's the dream of every single person, to lift ourselves up against God, to be so prideful and say, God, I don't need you. 
And so man forfeits his rest. And then what does God do? Pursues man once again. Says, you cannot do this alone. You cannot survive by yourself. And so God initiates once again forgiveness. And says, come back into my rest. And this is connected to us in the book of Exodus. Number four of the Ten Commandments. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Your rest is imperative. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And all of a sudden in Exodus chapter 20, do we have that on the screen this morning? Exodus 20? No? Okay, you guys just have to believe me on this, okay? Exodus 20. You keep the Sabbath holy. There it is. Look at that. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. Sabbath literally means rest. That's the word, rest. You're not going to do any work. You and your family, you just come together. Realize that God has set up something that he wants us to mirror in our lives. And the fact is, there's a time for work, but more importantly, there's a time of rest, a time to be replenished, a time to be refreshed. So Exodus 20 sets up the importance of this, that your life is more than work. Your life is more than your hobbies and your luxuries and your relationships. Your number one priority in life is to connect with God, and this is why he has set this up. And yet many of us forfeit that relationship. We forfeit that rest. So Israel didn't heed this counsel, and then we go to the prophets, Isaiah chapter 58. Once again, God initiating a relationship, extending forgiveness, saying, I'm not going to just let you guys die on the vine out there. I care. I love you. And so in Isaiah 58, here's what the, the prophet says. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, rest, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or taking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of David, your, of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 58, the promise that rest connects us with God, and ultimately this is the means in which God will bless and enrich our lives. Sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? But yet this is how we have been designed. And yet we have fallen far from this, have we not? If we're truly honest, we have forfeited our rest. We want God as giver we pray, God, give me, give me, give me. But before God ever wants to give us anything, he wants us to stop and know him as creator, as father, as God. Exodus 31, Moses says, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so that you will know that I am God, the Lord who sanctifies you. See, nothing matters more to God than your heart connection to him. God doesn't care about church attendance, doesn't care how well you sing, doesn't care how well you take communion. Oh, no, I did the juice first, more the first before the bread, right? Has anyone ever done that and thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to go to hell. No, you're all right. The order of communion doesn't matter. That's what's going on in here. See, God says, I want your heart. See, instead of being a day of rest, many of us have turned our lives into just constant, fruitless busyness. And we have forfeited our rest. And yet God has a rest designed for us, and he still extends that offer of rest today. This is why Jesus says in Mark 2, don't miss these words, because he declares himself Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of the rest. He says to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That is, that is so important because Jesus says, there is a day that is meant to serve you. There's a God who has set up a design in creation to serve you. You don't serve it. It serves you. And God has designed that day to serve you, to be a blessing to you. But you've got to slow down. Because I don't want you to forfeit your rest, three things we're going to look at this morning. First point is this. 
perfect rest can only be entered into by faith. There's no discussion of perfect rest without starting with Jesus. I could send you on a retreat to Fiji, not that I'm going to. I could sit you down and have you listen to the the Bible, MP3 app, Larry King narrating the Bible. Oh, so soothing to your spirits. It's not going to bring you rest. That was a Simpsons reference, just so you you guys know. So there's a rest that is given that could never be earned. You need to understand this. The rest Jesus offers is a gift, not something you earn through your works. Kevin during communion, referenced Matthew 11. Let's look at the verse again. Verse 28, Matthew 11. Jesus says these words, Come to me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you. It's a gift. Right? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, Jesus extends a gift Because he's saying to you, he's taking care of the payment for your restless heart. He's going to take care of the the sin that distracts us. He's going to take care of the rebellion that sometimes rules us. He's going to take that heart of disobedience and turn it into something different. And so Jesus is saying, I'm going to pay the price for you, give you a gift, forgive you freely, and I'm going to give you rest. And I want you to know that all true rest starts with me. It is a gift of my grace, not a result of your labor. That's why people clamor to try to get rest and they'll never get it. Because true rest is not you working, it's you believing. And that belief has to be anchored in something solid. I'm not going to believe in you, and I'm not going to believe in your job, and I'm not going to believe in your bank account. I'm not going to believe in your car. I'm not going to believe in your skills. I'm not going to believe in your talents. i got to go beyond you. i got to go to the one who proved he is worthy to be believed. And that is the person, Jesus Christ. Jesus comes to restore rest by establishing fellowship between us and God. He does that through the cross. That's why on the cross, Good Friday, he declares, it is finished. Stop laboring. Stop worrying. Stop working. Just stop and realize that the things you have been designed to to crave and long for and yearn and eat and drink are things that you cannot get. It is a gift. And that's why Jesus says, believe in me, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. A pastor friend of mine posted something the other day. He pastors in the D.C. area. Here's what he said. It's sobering to wake up and realize that while I slept like a baby during the early hours of Good Friday, Jesus pleaded, he wept, he relinquished, and was betrayed, falsely accused, tried, and beaten. Such is the radical mercy of the gospel. Christ works, and I rest. He accomplishes, and I benefit. He, the righteous, is indicted so that I, the guilty, might be pardoned. This is amazing grace. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works so that anyone should boast. We are his workmanship. See, he has designed you first to know Jesus, to have that perfect rest, and then you work for him. You don't work for approval, you work because you're already approved. Yes, Christ Jesus. We do these things for him, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. First you believe in Christ and find rest, and then you serve him. Look at Hebrews 4. Check this out. Hebrews 4, and it's kind of uh, maybe ironic that, you know, I own a coffee shop, and there's a Christian joke out there that says, you know, when the father wakes up in his home and serves his family, you know, he brews the coffee as stupid. Don't ever tell me that joke, all right? I'll, I'll kick you out. But, you know, in the name of Jesus, I'll kick you out, all right? So Hebrews 4. 
verse 1. We're going to read the whole chapter, and I don't want you to miss this. I do not want you to miss this. Verse 1. Therefore, let us fear, lest while the, a promise remains of entering his rest, any of you should seem to have come short of it. There's a rest that's out there that's promised, and yet people come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, and he's referring to Israel of old, the Old Testament, but the word that they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Israel heard it, but it didn't profit them, because it went just to their heads, and it didn't connect with their hearts. See, God does not want your intellectual assent to these truths. He wants your intellect combined with your heart so that you not only know it here, but you feel it here. For he who has believed enter that rest, just as he said, I have sworn my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. This is how Israel was punished. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Isn't that awesome? Before anything was ever created, God had designed to save us. For he has thus said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from his works, Genesis 2, which I referred to earlier. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Why? Because their hearts are not into it. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. The failure to believe. To believe. Unbelief runs rampant in our hearts. We have to fight that so that belief grows. He again fixes a certain day today. Circle that word. Here's the good news, right? What God is saying has relevance for today. Today is the day. We can't change yesterday. We have no control over tomorrow. So the writer has our attention fixed on right here, right now. Saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. How did it go with Israel? It didn't go well. But yet, we are like them if we harden our hearts to his voice. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would have spoken of another day after that. But there remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Circle that verse. There is given today a Sabbath rest for those who are willing to become the people of God. This is what Jesus offers. And for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through the same example of disobedience. The entrance is there. The rest is promised. And where does this come to an intersection? In the personal work of Jesus Christ. This is why he in Matthew 11 can say, I offer you rest. Are, are, you, are you hearing his voice? Are you, are you beginning to perhaps hear the voice of God right now? Because he's saying, do not turn a deaf ear or a hard heart to it. This promise stands, it stands today, and my prayer is that you would know and hear and heed his voice today. But this rest that we start with with Jesus is a rest that is given as a gift to us. You do not earn it. So the other day I'm in the Fry's parking lot, and I have a woman approach me with some pamphlets. And immediately I'm going, Mormon or Jehovah's Witness? She wasn't on a bike and wasn't wearing a tie. There was no Elder Bob on the tag. So I'm going, JW, Jehovah's Witness, right? And she's like, sir, if I could just have a minute of your time, I've got something I want to give you. And I said, hold your breath. I know Jesus and my life is secure in him. She's like, she didn't know how to respond to that. She goes, but I want to tell you about the glorious future that, that Jehovah, I said, I know about my glorious future. She's like, but there's, I said, I get to experience his riches now. And I get to experience his even greater riches in the future. I know Jesus. He has saved me from my sins. I am at peace with him right here, right now. And she's like, well, thank you for your time. And turn left. 
I almost felt like at that, and, and let's be honest, I mean, you see the guys right through your neighborhood, you're like, shut the windows, close the door, don't want to talk to these guys. Woman beelines it across the parking lot with pamphlets, you better load up those groceries fast. And, he, and here's what breaks my heart. Aside from really bad theology on their part, the worst part about what they've embraced is a salvation that they have to earn and work for. See, I can load up my groceries and be at peace at that moment and tell her about Jesus and that I don't have to do anything for him to believe. He has given me the gift of belief, and I am saved, and I can serve him from a heart that doesn't say I have to, but from a heart that says, I want to. So that, that's the difference. Jesus has done it all. Why would I now not want to live a life for him? And I want this woman to know that, and I want every Mormon to know that, and I want every follower of Allah and Islam to know this. Why? Because faith in Jesus set, is set apart from all other world religions. Every other religion says you work and hope at the end of the day you get to nirvana, paradise, whatever. Jesus says, I do the work for you. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'm going to give you rest. And at some moment, there's a part of your heart that is just is at peace, and you say, I accept that. It's a good feeling to know that God loves you, not because of your works, but because of your belief in the one who has worked for you, Jesus. Which brings us to our second point. Because I'm not going to end there as if, just come to Jesus and everything. No, because I would not serve you as a friend, as a brother, as a pastor, if I didn't tell you there's more involved when it comes to perfect rest. This is why when you have a guy like Billy Graham who passed away, what, three weeks ago, monumental in the world of evangelicalism, Billy Graham, in his crusades, spoke to who knows how many people in how many countries. But the problem that happened when you see these huge revivals happen, especially at the Billy Graham crusades, is that you get people coming down, walking the aisle, accepting Jesus, and then they're like, well, now what? And the amount of people that fall away because of the initial, like, oh, I want this, and my, there's no grounding in anything. They have excitement and exuberance for a moment, but then it's fleeting because they don't know, now how do I build my life on this belief in Jesus? Here's where the next two points are important. Number, number two, perfect rest can only be experienced by worship. You have now been saved to worship. There is no other vocation to your spiritual life that is more important than you becoming a worshipful man or woman. This is why Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 says, as you have received him, now you live in him. Okay, belief gets you to enter, now it's living in relationship that now turns you into a worshiper of the one true God. You've been worshiping false gods all your life, however they've treated you. Poorly. Now you've been introduced to the one true God who's going to take care of you. Now you live and worship with him. See, the problem in our lives is that we're either motivated by fear or motivated by greed. The, the, the idols of our day, the false gods of our age, are either motivating us by fear or greed. We're either living with this sense of scarcity or this sense of, of anxiety. And we have not learned how to worship God. And I'm going to tell you right now, worshiping God takes a lifetime to learn. And it is really that. It is learning and growing in relationship. 26 years ago, I asked my wife to spend forever with me. 26 years ago, I stood at the altar and I committed my heart to her. I would have been a fool 26 years ago to say I know everything about Lori. But I'd be a fool 26 years later to say I know everything about Lori. Her life has been expanded in more ways than I would ever comprehend. Who she is as a person, who she is as a woman, who she is as a wife, who she is as a mother. 
26 years, I continue to plumb the depths of who she is as a person, and I have not even hit the bottom yet. This is the way it is with God. He says, you come to Jesus, so that's like the altar, right? You're getting married to Jesus, now you get to spend the rest of your life knowing him, exploring him, getting to know him, and it gets richer and more satisfying and more joyful every single moment. This is what God wants for us. See, even a pastor out of Manhattan named Tim Keller said this, the resurrection of Christ is not just something to believe in, it is something to be lived. You come to Jesus and you enter a life that is unlike any other. So the rest in the first point is the rest that's given. Now I'm talking about a rest that is found or discovered. You're in, you have Jesus, now you get to plumb the depths of the riches and the treasures of Christ. This is why he says, come to me, all you who are weary, have laid, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You know what a yoke is? It was a wooden contraption, and Jesus, being a carpenter, would have been very acquainted with yokes. There would be a mother ox that they would attach one side of the yoke to, and then there'd be a baby ox that they attach the other side of the yoke to, and the mom would teach by means of this yoke how to live the life. So Jesus says, I've got the yoke on me. I'm the master. Now you learn from me. Let's put the yoke on you and, and now walk with me. This is why that promise is so important. See, it's not just come to me and find rest, but come to me and learn from me. How are you learning from Christ? How are you learning from the greatest teacher, the greatest philosopher, the greatest instructor who yet was very God in human flesh? How are you learning from him? Because learning from him amounts to worship. John chapter 4, the Father seeks those who are going to worship him in spirit and truth. The Bible says nothing about the Father seeking anything from us but, but true worship. True worship is this, truth and spirit. Head and heart. Too much head and not enough heart, guess what happens? You become legalistic and rigid. Too much heart and not enough here, it becomes sappy and sentimental, and you don't want that. There's a combination of truth and spirit. John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me. Don't do anything but just spend time. Live in me. How about Romans 12, Paul says, present yourselves as living sacrifices. And this is a daily thing. God, I want to live my life from you, for, for you. Teach me. You don't come to Jesus and automatically have your Jesus certificate or your, your master's of divinity or whatever degree you're on. You come to Jesus and go, I'm going to be in school for the rest of my life with Christ. There's never a graduation until you meet him in eternity. Amen? We're always, and if there's someone here that's told you they'd figure it out, they're a liar. Because you're always learning, you're always growing, and guess what? Sometimes you fail. There's pop quizzes, and sometimes you just bomb. So, But the good news is God works and grades on a curve, and the curve is always set by Jesus, and if you just let him take the test, you're always going to pass. Amen? That's by living by faith. So there's two things you need to be careful of. Well, one thing you need to be careful of, ritual rest in your notes. Ritual rest rest. This is the idea that you can earn it, that it's an activity or it's a religion or it's a day or, or whatever, and you're thinking like, you know, I don't know why I'm not resting. It's because you've be turned this into a ritual, something heartless, something feelingless, something truthless, and, and that's not what God has designed. It's like, you know, when we think of, like, candy, Easter candy, I'm just going to tell you guys, you know this about me. I Peeps are the candy of the devil, just so you guys know. Disgusting, horrible, from, from Satan himself. I, I had revealed this information years ago. I went on a men's retreat, and someone in the, in, in, during the day had put Peeps all over my bed, in my pillow, in my suitcase. I'm still going through counseling because of that experience. Horrible. Even Bill Maher, who, who's not a fan of religion, right? Bill Maher said, I'm going to establish a new rule. Will you please x-ray my stomach and see 
that the peeps are still in there. Not from this last Easter, but from the Easter in 1962, because I think they're still in there somewhere, right? Uh, what could even be worse than peeps? Well, maybe second up is uh, a hollow chocolate Easter bunny. Don't you hate that? I love Coffee with Jesus. Check out this cartoon. So I'm a big Coffee with Jesus fan. Hopefully you'll, I'll turn you guys onto it. So Coffee with Jesus. Even though I don't subscribe to your faith anymore, Jesus, I still kind of look forward to my mom sending me a beautiful uh, basket full of chocolates with a card. Oh, traditions are great, Kevin. Notice he's got his cappuccino cup. <laughs> they connect us to our past, to what matters. I'm glad your mom still does that for you. Then he says, but lately she's been sending the hollow Easter bunny instead of the solid one. It's a little sad. And then Jesus says, uh, it's a not-so-subtle message on your mom's part, Kevin. God bless her. So I, I think it's true that that ritual and religion and, and a lot of the stuff that this world builds or, or tries to promote as spirituality is really hollow. And it's Jesus who's, who's solid. And he's the one that offers your second blank real rest. Right? I'm not selling you on something where you're going to bite into it and find it empty. Like when I was traumatized as an eight-year-old when that Easter egg was empty right? This idea that real rest is promised to those who trust in Christ and get to know him. And you will find that the more you explore Jesus and learn from him, the more solid he is. The more the joy that he offers is true and the more the satisfaction he gives is real and that there's this inner rest of the soul that comes from knowing him and not only that, from him reminding you that he knows everything about you. To come naked before him. And to hear him say he loves us as we are, where we are, but he's not just going to leave us there. He's going to grow us and mature us. It's such a wonderful thing. We don't want people knowing us and judging us and condemning us. And yet there's a God who chooses to love us, who knows everything about us. And yet there's something deeply wonderful and satisfying with that. And I'm not going to go into details. My wife just took a defensive driving class yesterday. And, I, and I'm, you know, I, I love her. I'm still married to her. You know, I, I forgive her. But I, took, I picked her up from defensive driving yesterday. And, and, that, and the story of why she's there, you can talk to her about that. So she takes a defensive driving class, and I pick her up. And literally, it's not one minute she's in the car she is taking to task my driving because she just went to the class. She knows, she's like, can I, I know this class is about me, but literally in the past 30 seconds, you have committed five traffic violations. <laughs> and then by the end of her breath of saying that, I committed five more, right? Right? And literally, it was a five-minute trip home, and I think I just took Arizona law and the statutes, and I just turned them all on their head, you know. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I love my wife. I'm not going to change anything about my driving. But sometimes the voice of God sounds like my wife's voice, and I'll, and I'll tell you. That, but I will say that sometimes we who do love Jesus can come across like that. Isn't it true? Like you don't have your life together and we're just quick to go, you know what, we're, we're in the journey together. We're going to learn all about driving for the glory of Jesus in time. We're going to learn about worshiping Jesus in spirit and truth in time. But the question is, are you on that path? Because Jesus invites us to this. Are you growing as a worshiper? Because that's who you are more than you are anything else. And I'm sorry for the people that have ruined the experience of worship for you because maybe they came across too legalistic, too rigid. You know, I've been known to do that. And I have to stop myself at times. Because when did God ever say, you know what, Scott, you're going to be my earthly instrument in being representative of the Holy Spirit in everyone's life and tell them what to do and what not to do. You know, sometimes Christians just need to shut their bocas. You know what I'm saying? I'm a little bilingual. I'm sorry. It comes out once in a while. 
Um, sometimes we just need to just worship God and let him just work in someone else's life and say we're journeyers and we're sojourners and we're aliens and we're all doing this thing together. We are a community that wants to do that. And I, I want you to know if this is your first time with us, you are more than welcome to come with us any Sunday and even beyond Sunday because this is what it's like. We're just trying to make the best sense of God's will for our lives as possible. Sometimes we do well, sometimes we mess up. But the good news is you will never mess up so much where you ever fall outside the grace of our God. Amen? You guys said that like we're done. We're not done yet. All right? So worship is this ongoing activity. Let me, clo- let me just close this section with one verse, Matthew 6. Check these words out. Just this section. Seek first the kingdom of God, worship, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He is saying to you, nothing is more important for your daily routine than make his kingdom priority, number one. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and everything else in your life is going to be taken care of. And not only that, you will not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know where that restlessness comes in because of the regrets from yesterday and the worry about tomorrow? It's saying, nope, it's about God's kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will take care of itself. This is the promise for those who are going to worship him in spirit and truth. How do you need to prioritize his kingdom in your life? How do you need to reorient your your daily life and go, you know what, I have put God on the back burner. You're the person that has that license plate that says God is my co-pilot. These are scary people. Nothing about defensive driving class brings that up, does it? The person's like, God's my co-pilot. Listen, he's got to be pilot, pilot. he's got to be co-pilot, he's got to be the flight, he's got to do it all. Because if there's any one part of this where it's on me, this is scary. Amen? Seek first his kingdom. Let me leave you with the last truth. Some practical, practical, take with you homework application. Here we go. Perfect rest can only be expanded by trust. So you enter by believing. You're growing as you learn to worship him in spirit and truth. But as you worship him, you're going to learn to trust him. And I'm going to tell you an important principle, and this is not a real long principle. You can write it down. You can even tweet it if you want. The more trust, the more rest. You think you've rested when you come to Jesus, and he says, it's going to get more restful. What? It's It's going to expand in ways you never thought possible. So here's the principle. The more you trust, the more you will rest. Our experience of rest is proportionate to our trusting him. And this is what he says to us every day. Will you trust me? Because anxiety comes in because we can't make sense of life. Heads or tails, what's going on? I'm freaking out. And Jesus says, I've got this. You're no different than the disciples on the boat during the storm. Jesus is sawing logs. You're screaming, God save us! And you wake him up. We're going to die. We're going to die. And Jesus steps up and says three words. Peace, be still. The storm subsides. He looks at the disciples. And he doesn't really have to say anything. True faith is a belief plus trust. If you say you believe, but you're, you have anxiety and worry, you're no like, not like anybody else who doesn't have Jesus. As you cultivate a relationship with God, trust is going to be built up. And he's going to say to you, I've got this. Two things you can do in your life as you cultivate this life of worship and trust. Two things God has given to you. Trust is fueled by the word, the scriptures, the Bible, and it is fueled by prayer. 
Hebrews 11. I love how God's word just connects things for us. Because I need things connected pretty easily. Look at verse 12. So he's talked about the promised rest. You enter by faith. Jesus is the one who's got this. He's giving you the gift of rest. Now the, 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 the rest that's discovered comes fueled by the word and prayer. Look at verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it is able to pierce as far as the division of soul and spirit. That is sharp. Of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You've been in that place where you've read the Bible and got, oh my gosh, God can see my heart. And then we close it because we're like, he's exposed something about me. But just like a surgeon will get in there and remove something, identify something that's killing you, and he's saying, I've got to remove it. This is not doing anything for your health or your longevity or your life. God's word does the same thing. And there is no creature, verse 13, hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And he, he sees you. You're naked before him. And that's not a bad thing. You allow the word to do this work of removing the crud. Right? There's no other instrument God is going to use other than the word. And he's going to get in there and he's going to identify things. He's going to remove it. But it is ultimately for your good and his glory. If you want to learn more about that, join us any Sunday because we dive into the Word. And there, trust me, there's some Sundays I'm like, I just want to, I want to snooze and go, I, I miss church because I don't like what's here. As I wrestle with this during the week, I'm like, are you kidding me, God? I have to talk about this? He's not only do you have to talk about it, you have to heed it yourself. And then as you're processing it, you get together with others. And you get to help them process it. And then once we realize it, you know what the hardest part is? Is submitting to it. But by submitting to it, however hard it may seem, God says it's what's best. This is the power of the word to trust God that we may not understand, we may not like it, but God never says, you're going to like everything I'm going to have for you. But for some reason in the journey, as we embrace it, we grow to like it. It's, it's better than we ever imagined or thought. And then he says in verse 14, Since then we have a great high priest, Christ, who has passed through the heavens. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. The perfect high priest, the perfect mediator, the perfect redeemer, Jesus, says, I have given you this gift of of the word, I have given you this gift now of access to God. This is prayer. Look at verse 14, or uh, 15, 16. Let us therefore, draw, verse 16, draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. You can have confidence because God knows everything about you, and there's nothing to be worried about. He knows you. He loves you. And now he says, come to me. Draw near to the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's prayer. This is, this is the importance of the word and prayer. See, the, the word exposes things in our lives that God wants to remove, and he, he ex shows us things he wants to cultivate there. But prayer is the very thing we have as far as communication. That things we don't understand, we can go to God and say, God, I don't understand this. James 1 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let, let him ask of God, and God's going to give generously those who come to him. He's not going to leave you in the dark. He wants to help make sense of life, so he's going he's to invite us into communication, and communication literally is just prayer. Talk to God. You know, sometimes you go to God and go, God, I don't like you. I'm a little upset you put this here. How come you're making my marriage so difficult? How come my, come my kids are disobedient? How come my job's not working out the way I want it to? How come every time I get a raise, I think I'm going to get a little leg up, and I'm ending up getting set back because my car broke down, my air conditioning broke, yada, yada, yada. And God says, you can come to me with your frustrations. If you have a God that can't handle your frustrations, you need to look for a new God. Amen? Someone hundreds of years ago said this, and it's a hard phrase to, to love God, he says, sometimes I hate him. My God can handle 
that kind of heart. Because there's been times in my life, losing a mom to cancer, she died at 39. Love God? Why would he take this woman from our lives? A mother-in-law who died of colorectal cancer. Dealing with infertility for ten, almost 10 years with my wife. Having friends betray you. I mean, we could probably go around this room and say, I hate God because of this. I'm frustrated with God because of this. I can't stand him because of this. Well, what does prayer do? Prayer allows you to connect with God at that level, but as long as you're connected with him, your life will not go off the rails. Let those frustrations and those doubts move you closer to God. And while he may not give you explanation, I do know the one thing he will give you that you want more than an explanation is himself. Don't ignore reality. Don't ignore the promises of Christ. The greatest reality we have in our lives right now and will always be Jesus. That 2,000 years ago, God came in human flesh, died upon a cross, a death he didn't deserve to die, but he did it for us, was buried and rose again on the third day. And I'm not going to go into the historical evidence, but I'm going to tell you right now, there has not been a body produced and there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. And I'm going to say what he claimed to do and be is exactly what he did. And I'm going to believe that. Do not let your life be mired by unbelief. There are guys today, men and women today, who still believe the earth is flat. Can you believe it? Last weekend, a guy built a homemade rocket in California, launched himself up about a third of a mile in the, into the air to prove that the earth is flat. I'm going, good luck, buddy. Rocket fizzled out, parachute landed him back to the ground, banged up a little bit. The reporters clamored around him. So what are you going to do now? He said, I just want to go home and eat dinner and be with my cats. Literally, that's what he said. You see what unbelief will get you? I question his sanity just because he has cats, but that's another story for another time. But we live in a world where people are denying truth, denying truth that should be so evidentiary. Ladies and gentlemen, the earth is not flat. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is Lord. Let me close by saying today is April Fool's Day. And yet every day is a fool's day for the person that will continue to live their life apart from God. You are a fool to believe that this world has promised you life and satisfaction because all of us who have been around the block a few times know that what the world promises never delivers. And every day we wake up listening to the voice of the world, and every night we go to bed feeling the fool because we bought into the lie. Don't let the world's love and pleasure and everything woo you away from the one love that's ultimately going to bring joy and satisfaction, that's the love of Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Rest in Him. Amen? Let me close with this. You've got a little insert, little card on the inside here. We, like I said, we keep it real here. I, I thought about keeping, calling this the keep it real zone or maybe Jesus' play date. I don't know. One of those things is happening here today. But um, we, we just are people that want to earnestly and honestly follow Jesus and love him. And if you desire to just want to maybe get together and talk more about that, uh, I would love to connect with you. Um, coffee's on me. Why? Because Hebrews, right? Um, <laughs> dumb. Stupid. Yeah, seriously. Some of you are like, just because of that, I'm not coming back. Because <laughs> I don't like cheesy jokes, all right? In your card, here's, just write a little note. I'd love to connect with you, Scott. Or connect with a leader. If you're a female, we've got some great women leaders here on, on, on board. We've got some great male leaders for those that just dudes that want to connect. But I would love to set you up and, and talk about next steps. Because it's so much more than this. This is, this is life. This is everything. And we want you to be a part of this journey. Um, because there's nothing like it in the world. There's nothing like I would not devote my life to it.
if it wasn't everything I even told you about and, and more. So we're glad you're here. Give me your email, your phone number, and I'd love to connect with you. God's not done. God's not done with any of us. Amen? We have today. We might have tomorrow. And if we have tomorrow, praise God, we get to walk in it again. Let's stand. Uh, Father, it's uh, it's a wonderful morning to be together, and yet not like any other morning that we get to wake up to, not only witness creation, but Lord, there's a there's a lo- a wooing from you that wants us to connect with you, the Creator. And Lord, we want to know more about the rest that you offer. Help us to 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 not only believe in Christ, but to trust Him. And allow that faith experience to be ever deeper. Thank you for the reminders today, for the for the time we've had, and Lord, looking forward to, to the future. Because we know you're in control of it all. Thank you for loving us and for giving us Jesus as the greatest gift for our, our lives as possible. To you be the glory forever and ever. We praise you, Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. Great week. He is risen. All right. Onward.